And we want to continue the second half of our study from last week. And I want to remind you of the main theme of the book of 1 Peter. It is to live a godly life in obedience to Christ, even in times of suffering. Peter is asking us to live a sanctified life, even in times of hardships. So that's the main theme of First uh, Peter. I'll be reading and preaching from the New American Standard Bible. And part of our holy living is serving. Part of obedience to Christ is serving Christ in times of suffering. And the title of our message this morning is Serving in Suffering. This is uh, part 8 of our series set apart for God's service. So please stand and let's read beginning in verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4 beginning in verse 7. Peter said that the end of all things is near. Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And be hospitable to one another without complaint. And as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold of grace of God. In verse 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who speak, is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do so, so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You may now take your seat. This is God's Word. About two years ago, we experienced this uh, pandemic, um, COVID, and many churches were tested during this time, or that time, and when the government placed a lot of restrictions, and churches have different opinions, if whether to remain open, or continue to gather as church, or stop the physical gathering every Sunday. I want to emphasize the physical gathering every Sunday. You know, for the sake of safety, people are confused about whether the church is essential. Many churches are confused. Is church important? Is it essential? Many people say it's not that important. It's not that really essential. It's not essential. We, we can live without it. It's, it's optional. It depends on the situation. And many professing Christians jump ship. They compromise and allow the government to infringe on the church. And some were persecuted justly. And some were persecuted unjustly. But the majority of churches opt for whatever works strategy. You know, whatever works strategy. It's really up to the churches. You know, if you want to meet virtually, go for it. Whatever you want. Or however they want to do church and forget about God's standard. And all of this is because of fear of sickness and death, right? And sadly, all those efforts went in vain since most, if not all, what happened? Got what? COVID. There you go. Many churches were unmasked. And what we discover is we have a lot of uh, superficial and shallow churches. Truly, suffering and trials are blessing. Sufferings are blessing. It shows where we're at in our Christian walk. It really shows our strength and weaknesses. Now, I'm not here to give my opinion or to revive this old controversy. But I'm here to let you know that we are called to serve. You are called to serve even in times of suffering. Resigning from our role as servants in the face of opposition 
is not an option. Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is no discharge in the time of war. Because we understand that man is born for trouble in Job 5, 7. It says, for man is born for trouble, sparks fly upward. In Job 14, verse 1, it says, man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. And we can understand that. We know that life is hard. In John 16, Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation. And he said, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And this is the situation of the Christians who receive this letter from Peter. That's their situation. It's uh, various trials, it says there. They were scattered and living in various trials. That is sickness and that is death. That is job loss, economic disaster, persecution. But listen, church, but I hope you notice that Peter didn't ask them to isolate themselves, right? Or even restrict themselves to gather. Or distance themselves from one another. In fact, it's the other way around. They were scattered, and he was asking them to what? To gather and practice the what? The one another. He's saying to them, practice the one another's. Peter said to them, love one another fervently. Just watch the emphasis there. Fervently. Be hospitable to one another. The emphasis is what? Without complaint. And I hope you know this. Again, the emphasis, because when the going gets tough, what? We need extra level of virtue. We need extra level of virtue. We need an added booster. And I hope you also notice, it is also in the time of crisis that Peter said to them, employ serving one another. Employ serving one another. And of course, we're not uh, willy-nilly. We calculate the risk. You know, we use wisdom and discernment, but we need to be reminded that, that we have these obligations to one another. As a church, and God is expecting us to be His church, right? Even in times of suffering, He is expecting us this one another's. Well, last week, we looked at the perspective we need in verse 7. If you look at verse 7, he said, The end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. What's happening is our world is not getting better. It's becoming worse every day. Wickedness is rising. Sickness is towering, deception is expanding, rejection of God is growing. It's not getting any better, but that's okay. That's part of God's plan. What's going on in our society today is God's plan. He wants evil to go its way. That's the plan. Why? Because he's coming back. Christ is approaching, therefore we need to be what? Of sound judgment and ask yourself, really to ask yourself, what if I gain the whole world and lose my soul? What's the benefit? Since he's coming back, what if I gain the whole world and lose my soul? Do I really want to be afraid of sickness? You're going to be asking yourself, do I really... Want to be afraid of sickness who can kill my body or be afraid of God who can destroy not only my body but also what? Soul. Also soul. You also want to ask yourself, do I really want to enjoy sin now and pay it later? Since Christ is coming, do I really want to enjoy sin. Since the Lord is coming, what would be my priority? And so Peter said we need to be of sound judgment. 
to be healthy in our decision, to examine our lives, to be thinking about the cause, to be temperate and prudent in our action. Again, he said in verse 7, for what purpose? For the purpose of prayer and right perspective in life. That is the end of all, of all things is near. That's the right perspective in life that leads you to prayer. Why? Because people learn to pray when life is beyond their control, right? You learn to pray when you cannot control things. And one Bible teacher said, and I want to quote this again, prayer is the access to all spiritual resources. But believers cannot pray properly if their minds are unstable due to worldly pursuits. If your mind is about material things, you know, earthly possession, you can pray because you're unstable. He said, ignorance of divine truth or indifference to divine purpose. And R.C. Sproul said, prayer prompts and nurtures obedience, putting the heart in the proper frame of mind to desire obedience. Because you cannot lie to God when you're praying. You're the most honest person when you're praying. And today, there are three, there are things we need to obey. These are the things we need to do as church. If you look at verses 8 to 11, so we want to continue. Last week, we talked about the servant's perspective. And so today, we want to talk about the servant's obligation in verses 8 to 11, A, and servant's intention in verse 11b and so we need to have the right perspective because we have this obligation and we need to have the right intention that is in verse 11b so let me begin with servant's obligation look again in verses 8 to 11 i want to read this to you again above all keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, and as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold of grace of God. And then he said, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. Now, there are three crucial obligations we see here. There are three. Pay attention to the phrase, one another. In verse 8, love for one another. In verse 9, be hospitable to one another. In verse 10, serving one another. These are duties, friends. These are duties to one another. You have a duty to me, I have a duty to you. Loving one another, be hospitable to one another, serving one another. And Peter begins with this mutual love for one another. We need to be concerned with our relationship. When the going gets tough, we don't separate, we don't isolate. We need to cultivate this mutual relationship even more. He said here, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. Why? Love for one another is the supreme virtue we need to exercise. That is the supreme virtue we need to exercise. This is what Jesus commanded his disciples. If you turn your Bibles to John chapter 13, and this is Jesus, the Lord of glory, giving his farewell speech to his disciples in John 13, beginning in verse 33. Because Christ will be crucified and he will go back to his father. And he said to his disciples in John 13 verse 33, he said, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, now as I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. Look at verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Why did the Lord tell them to love one another? Is this just a, an emotional experience? Is this just a, a religious experience? 
Is this uh, sentimental? No, because if you go to chapter 15, turn to chapter 15 of John. In John 15, in verse 18, Jesus said to them, If the world hates you, now the word if there is... Uh, it's a third conditional clause, so you can understand it this way. Since the world hates you, or because the world hates you. He said, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. And so probably the reason why that you don't have the love for one another because you already have the love of the world. You already have what you need. Because maybe you're loving the world and that's why you don't have love for the church. But Jesus said you need to love one another because the world hates you. Because the world hates the truth. And so the only genuine love that you have is in the church. The world, the culture hates Christian, and the only place that you can experience genuine love is in the church, genuine fellowship. And I don't want to say genuine, I want to say true love is in the church, because what you have from the world is what? A fake kind of love. They just love those who um, they love, but in the church, we love sacrificially. Genuine concern is in the church. Turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 for a moment. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, this is a familiar text in verse 23. It says there, Let us hold fast. In other words, persevere the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promises faithful. And look at verse 24 in Hebrews 10 verse 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And look at verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. In other words, don't forsake the gathering, the physical gathering of the church. And then he take note there, as is the habit of some, because some has a habit of, this is a sinful habit, forsaking the gathering, forsaking the church. Why? Because again, they love the world. They don't need the church. And they forsake the gathering they're okay with just watching on TV, even if they have this capability and ability to gather. They're too, too busy on Sunday. They're, they're too um, preoccupied on Sunday. And so they forsake the church. Why again? Because they, they have enough of love from the world. But here... And we can see that in times of trials, he said there, let us hold fast, let us persevere the confession of our hope and stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Do not forsake the gathering of the church. And look at the last phrase. Why? And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So second coming is an urgent matter, right? That is, that phrase drawing near is telling us the coming of Christ. And so since Christ is coming, we have this obligation to one another. He said they're encouraging one another. That is comforting. That is giving warning to one another, strengthening one another. Now, going back to 1 Peter, Peter said our love must be fervent. Now, if you remember in Romans chapter 12, verse 9, Peter said, let love be without hypocrisy. And so our love must be sincere. This is the kind of love that we need. 
sincerity to one another, however, that will be tested. If we are truly sincere, that will be tested. You know, the more you hang around, the more we meet, the more we gather, the more we spend time together, there is a high risk of offending one another. Right? When people meet, when people gather, and we're still sinners, we still sin, and we try to serve one another, and we will see our weaknesses. And that is a great potential or risk of offending one another. You know, as the saying goes, sheep bites, sheep stinks. Right? That's why Peter said our love must be fervent. And the word fervent means stretch out. The word fervent means our love must be extended. Our love must be on its maximum effort. Fervent love describes intensity. Our sincerity will be tested. Is it really strong? Is it really boosted? Is it really strengthened? You will be tested if you truly love the church. Are we really durable in our love? And the best time to test the love is when? When times are easy or when times are tough? When times are tough. And you will be tested if you truly love one another. Why? Look at verse 8. Because love covers a multitude of sin. And so fervent love has uh, muscles. It, it quickly forgives. It has this uh, spiritual amnesia. It overlooks unkindness. If we're not ready to forgive, we'll be offended even by small things. Because sometimes we say offending things, right? And sometimes we bring worldly influence into the church, sinful stuff that we get from the workplace. We bring that into the church, you know, wicked stuff, sinful stuff. And we bring that into the church. And when words are many, sin is not absent. Sometimes our yes is not yes. Uh, sometimes our no is not no. We don't keep our promises. And sometimes our expectations are not met. You know, other to do things differently. We have preferences. And you get displeased with, you know, with, with all kinds of preferences. And sometimes you receive uh, snarky comments. Sometimes you receive harsh words, impatient remarks. You receive that a lot. And churches are filled with the Pharisees following Jesus, looking for reason to accuse him. And we're not like that. We're not like that. We cannot be like a Pharisee just watching Christ and looking for a moment, the right moment to accuse him. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And I want you to remember this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning in verse 20, it says, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20, it says, indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. And so you need to begin there. Once you enter the church, you expect sin can happen. Look at verse 21. Also, Solomon said, do not take seriously all words which are spoken. Why? So that you will not hear your servant cursing you. Why? For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others, you see. In other words, we shouldn't keep strict records of offensive words and even actions. We don't get offended easily. Because there are many times we say many offensive words to others too. And we need forgiveness as well. 
What we need to do is to cover that sin with love. We need to be ready to forgive. We are be ready to receive and willing to let go. Why? Because love bears all things. Love hopes all things, believes all things, and endures all things. And as we serve the church, you see, you need to, um, you need to expect, expect to be hurt. And that could discourage you. That could uh, dishearten you. Our relationship can persevere if we have a fervent love. Love that is durable, that is stretchable, that is intensified. That's what we need. So let me ask you this. Is your love for one another fervent? Are you easily get offended? And one of the marks of mature Christian is not, they're not easily get offended. They are patient when wrong. Now, I'm not saying that you need to control your anger. Not, that's kind of superficial. You know, you always give your best smile even if you're irritated. That's, that's hypocrisy. What I'm saying here is you don't even realize the harshness. You know, you're, you're, you're not really thinking about it. That kind of love, that kind of maturity. And so that's what we need. We don't take it seriously because people will come here and uh, sometimes they're impatient, right? And most of the time when they have uh, trials in life and their patience is not there, and so immediately we cover that sin. We don't take it seriously. Now, the second love we see here is in verse 9. It says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. Go back to 1 Peter. And that word means lover of strangers. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, be hospitable to one another without complaint. This means opening your home to care for needed Christians. And of course, in Peter's days, there are uh, traveling preachers. And they cannot stay to a, a hotel or a motel because there's a lot of sexual immorality happening there. And so many Christians, you know, they allow these traveling preachers to stay in their home. They open their homes to serve others. And here's the point. He adds here the phrase, without complaint. In other words, without selfish attitude. Why? Because love must be sacrificial, willing to give. If you turn your Bibles to uh, James chapter 5, verse 8, he says there, You to be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. And that is the, and here's the phrase again, the second coming of Christ. In James 5, verse 8, and then in verse 9, he said, Do not complain, brethren. Do not complain against one another. So why do not complain? Why without complaint? Why? Because by default, we love our privacy, true? You love your privacy. We don't like to be disturbed. And hospitality is a lot of work. And hospitality is a lot of what? Expenses. And when the going gets tough, economic disaster, like what we're experiencing right now, economic hardship, it's really hard to obey this. And much more, it's really hard to obey this if you're just looking back to what happened in, in COVID, can't even open your home. But Peter said, be hospitable. Be hospitable without any complaint. Let's move forward. Another in verse 10. In 1 Peter verse 10, if you look at verse 10, he said, the third one is serving one another in verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. Now, our spiritual gifts are essential, especially in times of trials. And so we don't resign our post. We don't abdicate our role. 
in times of trials and opposition. We continue to serve. We, we put urgency in serving, and there are principles we need in serving the Lord, even in the most difficult times. And so I'm going to ask you some question. This is a diagnostic question, so you can evaluate yourself if you're ready to serve in suffering. Because again, Peter wrote this in the context of various trials. And he's telling them, employ serving one another. Question number one. And this is a, a Sunday school question. Do you receive a special gift? He said there in verse 10. Look at verse 10. As each one has received a special gift. Each believer received a spiritual gift. If you're a believer, you have a spiritual gift. It is special because only true Christians have this gift. It is special because spiritual gift is not a talent. It's not a skill. It is a spiritual gift. Talent and skills are what? Natural gift. These are supernatural gift. And unbelievers, they may have skills, they may have talents, but they cannot have spiritual gifts. This is special because only true believers have spiritual gifts. Again, unbelievers don't have divine enablement to serve the church. Now, it is also special because it is unique to you. This special gift is unique to you. As one Bible teacher said, it's like a fingerprint. It's like a fingerprint. And so if you don't exercise your gift, no one will replace you. Here in church, that is unique to you. And so if you stay home... And you don't gather, you isolate yourself. No one can replace you. No one can replace you. It's unique to you. Why? Because in Ephesians 4, 7, God arranges the gift differently. He's the one assigning it. And He gives you the necessary faith to exercise them. That is in Romans chapter 12. And He didn't give us an equal measure. He gives us this unique gift. That you alone has it. It's special. It's, it is unique. It is a combination of gift. The blending of spiritual gift. This is unique to you and to you alone. So you need to understand that. And you need to ask yourself, do I receive this gift? And then if yes, you have a great responsibility because that is unique to you. And the church needs you. That's why Peter said, employ it. Use it. So the next question is, question number two, do you know that you don't deserve it? That's an important question because our problem is pride. And so we cannot boast about our salvation and we cannot boast of our service. Peter said it is a special gift. It is a gift. You don't earn it. You cannot buy it. You cannot work for it. You received it. It's grace to you. It is freely given to you as God's gift. And so therefore, if it's given to you, and you don't earn it, you don't work for it, it's easy to what? Give it to someone. Right? It's easy to give it to someone. Question number three, look at verse 10. Let me ask you this. Do you employ it in serving one another? Look at verse 10. Peter said, employ it in serving one another. So let me ask you this. If you have this spiritual gift and you didn't work for it, you don't deserve it, do you use it? That's a good question. Do you employ it in serving one another? And that word employ means diakoneo from the word diakonos, servant. That's why we have this word employee. Servant. In other words, be a deacon to one another. And so you don't say, well, I'm not a deacon in here in church. That's for the, that's deacon's job. No, we're all servants, right? We're all servants. Be servant to one another. And notice there's a play on words here because the word employ is also serve. And so it's 
Peter is saying, serve it in serving one another. Serve it in serving one another. Employ it in serving one another. Since you're unique and no one else can do your duty, since you receive this grace, your gift is not for you, the only response to this is serving one another. Your spiritual gift is not for you. It's for others. God giving you these gifts so you can employ it to one another. To serve one another. And again, the one another there means be a servant to servants. Right? Be servant to servants. And we can understand the, the relationship of master and slave. And it's easy to serve a master. You know, but it's hard to serve servants. That could be a challenge. Why? Because you might give your all. And the return is not the same. And so therefore, this one another emphasizes active willingness. Active willingness. In other words, here's the point. We're just a channel of God's grace. And if you don't serve, you interrupt the flow. If you don't serve, you block the pipes. And then the, the connection is gone and it doesn't flow directly. And so if you're not here and you're the only one who has that gift, the, the, the pipe is blocked. You know, help me with the illustration. Just use your imagination, right? In the body, the church gets weak because one part of the body is what? Malfunctioning. And so you need to employ your gift. Now, question number four. Let me ask you this. Are you a good steward of God's grace? Are you a good manager of God's grace? Look at verse 10 again. It says, as good stewards of the manifold of grace of God. And that word steward, it means, it has two words in Greek. Oikonomos, oikos means household. Nemo means allotment or portion. We have a portion. In other words, we're responsible for managing what God has given us. So God gives us this portion to manage. You know, the range, uh, the scope, and the height. He gives us the health and the strength, the maturity, unity, and the growth of this church is based on how we manage our spiritual gift. And so I have a role here in church, and you have a role. God given me this spiritual gift. God gave you spiritual gift. And if you're not managing that spiritual gift, what will happen? The maturity and the growth of this church is depending on that. You have a role to play. We're all stewards of the manifold of grace. Now question number five. Do you know how many spiritual gifts you need to manage? And so, I need to know if I receive the gift... I need to remember that is grace. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. I need to use it. I need to manage it. Number five is how many spiritual gifts that I need to manage. That's the idea there in verse 10. Manifold of grace. And the word manifold means multifaceted. It's like the intake and exhaust manifold of a car so just use your imagination the intake and ex exhaust manifold it has i believe four it's connected to one pipe going to the exhaust right it's multifaceted it literally means many color in other words listen two believers may have the gift of teaching but they're not the same each will show a unique blend of gift that will demonstrated differently. For example, some teachers have the gift of mercy. They have the gift of teaching and they have the gift of mercy. And so the emphasis is different. Right? They're more compassionate. Some teachers have the gift of teaching and the gift of wisdom. And the emphasis is different. 
they're really good on how to uh, apply the Bible skillfully in application because they have the gift of wisdom. And some teachers have the gift of teaching and have the gift of discerning truth. And the emphasis is different. So many callers, very unique to a Christian. Some teachers have multiple of gifts. They have the gift of administration. They have the gift of teaching. So let me ask you this. Do you know how many gifts do you have? Because you have to manage those gifts. Blending of gifts. And so you need to know those gifts. And again, we need to be good stewards, faithful and obedient to the portion that God has given us. Because no one has that gift except you. That's the point. That's unique to you. You're irreplaceable, in other words. I cannot replace the unique giftedness of those who are not ministering. If you're not serving, I cannot replace you. And so are you utilizing all the spiritual gifts that God has given you? Remember again, God will judge the household first. Now question number six, I want to ask this quickly in verse 11. Do you know what category of spiritual gifts you have? Do you know what category or which category do you belong? Again in verse 11, whoever speaks, and you can see that in verse 11, and it says there, whoever serves. And in here, we see two broad categories of spiritual gifts again. The gift of speaking and the gifts of serving. Speaking and serving. And this is what we call permanent gift. And we will look at this um, next time. But let me give you a, a quick list. Speaking gift. That is the preaching, the teaching, wisdom, knowledge, and discernment. That belongs to speaking gift. Just an example. And according to Peter, they must speak the utterance of God. In other words, the preacher and teacher must speak the scripture alone. Not human opinion. Not movies. Not man-made philosophy. Not culture. This person who has this speaking gift must speak the utterance of God. The word of God. And again, this is the preacher a teacher with wisdom, knowledge, and discernment. Now, the second category is serving. If you look again in verse 11, whoever serves is to do so, so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. And there are, you know, administration, the gift of prayer, help, and mercy. Just an example. This belongs to serving gifts. Now, it says there, the strength which God supplies. And so basically, it's not merely physical strength, not merely that. We need that, but not only that, but in context, this is the, uh, the supernatural strength that God provides a believer. We serve by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus did what he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because suffering can be outside our control, and when when uh, times are tough, we're either consumed by our problem or we are consumed by the Holy Spirit, right? It is either we're controlled by the Holy Spirit or we are controlled by fear and, and doubt. And we cannot serve the church with human power or strength. Because, listen to this, if it is according to human power, let me tell you this. We're not prayerful enough. Right? If it's according to our flesh, we're not helpful enough. We're not merciful enough. Let alone administration. We cannot even fix our lives apart from God's grace. So this is, this, this is coming from a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. It is by God's strength that we can serve and so God is coming, the Lord Jesus is approaching, and He expects us to live a holy life. He wants us to continue the one another's. He wants us to continue serving, using our spiritual gift, 
the faith that we need, the portion we need to function. He gave us His Word. He gave us His, his He gave us strength, and He gave us all we need to prepare. So what's the purpose of all this? Look at verse 11b. What's the purpose? What's the intention? When we come to church, what is our intention? It says there in verse 11b, So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so God, God's purpose for saving us through Christ Jesus is to glorify Himself. And He placed us here in church to glorify Him. Everything about our Christian life is for the glory of God and our intention to serve even in the toughest time, even in the toughest culture, is to glorify Him. Our intention is to glorify God. The purpose of fulfilling our obligation in the midst of this crooked and evil generation is to glorify God. Folks, if that is our intention and purpose, I guess, I guess our safety is not really a matter. Our safety is basically secondary. If that is our intention, to glorify God in all we do, probably our safety is secondary. Self-preservation is secondary. Ultimately, we don't preserve ourselves. We need to understand that God is preserving us. Ultimately, it is God who preserves us. And we can rejoice in suffering. We have an obligation to one another. The church is not a place to fulfill your selfish ambition. You don't come to church with an intention for yourself. So we come to church to glorify God. Our intention when coming to church is to boast about God. That He will return in His glory. That is our intention. And if you haven't submitted yourself to the Lordship of Christ, and if you hear His voice today, throw yourself to Christ. Submit your life to Christ. Be under His Lordship, and do not harden your hearts. Because time will come that you find yourself dead in your sin, and there's no turning back. So this is the time wherein you need to be of sound judgment and count the cost. Is it really worth it? And I pray that all of us here is ready to serve in suffering. We don't resign from our post. We continue to serve the Lord. We continue to gather. We need the one another even more in times of difficulties in life. That is the testimony of Scripture. Let us pray. Father, we come to you humbly, helping us, O oh God, to persevere in our faith. We know, Lord, that you will test our love to one another, so help us, O oh God, to be durable, to be stretchable. We know, Lord, we still have this body, and we still sin, and we can offend others without your restraint. And so we ask now, O oh Lord, that you uh, give us more grace that we need to be patient, with one another. Whenever we hear snarky remarks or even impatience or even um, unkind words, even at, at home, uh, we ask, Father, that you help us to have uh, this kind of love that is patient when wrong. And we can only do this if we are practicing these spiritual attitudes, cultivating spiritual attitudes that we need so we can persevere until you come. In Christ's name, amen.